At only 19, Kevin tried to take his life by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. The fall broke his body, but not his spirit. Kevin's life is an example of hope and healing to all of us, and I'm confident that each of you will take away something positive from what he has to say this morning. We understand that this can be a very personal topic, and several of you may have been directly impacted by this at some point in your life. If you need to step out at any point during Kevin's presentation, please exit out the back doors of the auditorium. There is a counselor on site wearing a green ribbon on her wrist who can meet you there. When you came in today, you were given a survey to complete. We ask that you just hold on to that until Kevin has finished speaking. And before you leave today, just fill it out and hand it to a member of the diversity team. They're wearing little green buttons on their shirts. So before you leave, just fill that out. If you need a pen, you can see one of them also. Thank you so much for coming today. We're going to watch a short video, and then Kevin will share with you. Is something wrong, or can I help you? Those were the words that I desperately wanted to hear right before I catapulted myself over the rail. I have now lived 15 years past the day I should have died. When you see a lot of mental illness being expressed, that's a clue that the culture is sick, not the person. Hey brother. Hello Kevin. You were the first person to ever say, you know, Kevin, you should talk about this. Our guest, Kevin Hines, plummeted 200 feet but survived. Today, I travel the globe spreading a message of hope. Why? Because we know it helps people heal. There's a huge opportunity as we talk about stories of survival to support people who are out there who are in pain. I break down on a regular basis. I have symptoms every day. Um, I still have hallucinations, both auditory and visual. Families of those who jumped from the iconic structure urged to stop the suicides. One person goes to this bridge to die every seven to ten days. I think it's our obligation to stop it. You go to Paris, go to New York, you go to Istanbul, there are suicides. The more people that know about the horror of that bridge, the more pressure will be put to do something to stop it. Will this really decrease suicides, you think? They say things like, why ruin the aesthetics? What are the aesthetics of a bridge compared to one human life? Kevin Hines, there's no telling how many lives were saved by you because you weren't able to take your own. Let's get to that place that nobody is being brave who talks about their brain disease. They're just being honest. My name is Kevin Hines, and this is my story. Hi. Hey, it's good to see you all. Thank you for coming out today. Um, before I begin to share with all of you my story, there's something we have to do. Right here, right now, and together. We must take a moment of silence for all of those that we have lost to death by suicide from lethal emotional pain. In my short 37 years on this beautiful planet, I've lost eight people I love this way, not the least of which was my biological mother, Marcia. May she rest in peace. And the most recent of which was my three of my greatest friends in the suicide prevention activist field, three of the greatest of their, of their kind, the most prolific, most experienced, most intelligent, most giving of their time. But today, my new friends, is not about the way they died or the day they died, no. Today is about how they lived before they ever got sick in the first place. Today is about the beauty that they were and the light that exuded from within them when they were still here. And today, we can choose to hold immeasurable gratitude for the very little time we had with them. I celebrate the lives of those eight I lost to suicide on their birthday the day they were brought into this world without that pain. And I do it with people who love them just as much as I do. Because the only way to properly grieve a suicide, in my opinion, is together, without blame and with no guilt. It doesn't belong to us. It never did. It never can. It's too much weight for anyone's shoulders to bear. That weight and that guilt you feel, if you've, felt, if you've ever felt it, from someone you've lost to suicide, Brush it off your shoulders. 
They died because of lethal emotional pain, not because of you. Today is about hope and finding light at the end of every darkened tunnel. Even if you think that, that that light doesn't exist, even if you believe that that hope is not there, you just haven't walked far enough to reach it. Let us honor their memories. Let us hold them dear. Let us hold immeasurable gratitude for the very little time we had with them. And right now, if you would bear with me, in a moment of silence, let us please stand honoring their memory, if you're physically capable. Please sit down. Thank you. He is ancient, yet ageless. He is ticking, yet timeless. He runs, not hunted. He chases. He is a man of many faces. He is the darkness where I am the light. I may be cracked, but I will never be broken. I wrote that limerick in eighth grade about the intense duality I'd felt inside since fourth grade. Fourth grade was the first time I ever heard auditory hallucinations in my head. You think I told anybody? No. No, I buried it. As a fourth grade child, I didn't know what words to use to express these voices in my head that weren't that of my conscience. Murmurs in my head I didn't quite understand, but I knew one thing. They hated me and wanted me gone. Fourth grade was also the first time I was tormented. Uh, it was also for the fourth year of being tormented by the eighth grade class. The eighth grade class of my grade school. It was an all white school and I am not all white. And they had a problem with that. They made it clear, very, very clear. Every single day they would torment me. They would hold a fourth grade child's head down like this and say, swing, little n-word swing. They would pull my ears from behind me as hard as they could and say, whistle, little n-word whistle. Or they simply would just pick me up, turn me upside down, and place me in a garbage can face first, and then tell me that's what I was as they held my feet down. You wonder why I heard fourth, f voices in fourth grade? No, right? Right? Right. right. And, uh, but if we're going to do this story any justice, we got to take us all the way back to the day I was born. Born in squalor, in a crack motel, in the Tenderloin of San Francisco, the worst neighborhood there then, worst neighborhood there today. Born to biological parents, Marcia Silvera and Martino Ferales. He was half Mexican, half Italian, arguably the best parts of me. That was a joke. <laughs> it was a good one. And Marcia hailed from James Bond Island, Jamaica, St. Mary's Island. And she was many things. You can think of me as everything but Russian. Let's go with that. And um, my biological mom and dad had nothing and no one but themselves and their two, in my humble opinion, beautiful baby boys. Me and my only full-blooded brother. My name wasn't always Kevin Hines. That is my adopted white name. No offense, white people. I'm part white. We're still friends. Calm down. No, it's all good. No, no. My biological name was Giovanni Gabriel Prasad Perales. Say that 10 times fast. <laughs> but somehow my brother's name was just Jordash. Mom and dad, what the hell? <laughs> where are his other three names? You know, where's the consistency, mom and dad? And my birth mom and dad, they had nothing and no one but us and themselves. And they were madly in love. And they, and they, they had unconditional love for their two infant boys, right? Jordash was maybe 12 months apart from me, so you know they were busy, right? All right? And <laughs> just those of you who didn't get that, nine months to make a baby, okay? And, and so Jordash and me, um, we lived in squalor with concrete slab floors and box springs for mattresses, the kind of places you paid for by the hour, and if you didn't, you were out. And mom and dad did whatever they had to do to pay on that hour by that hour, however illegal. They did score and sold drugs. I'm told my, my dad sold my mom. That was their life. And that was our life. And so one fateful day, one seedy motel clerk makes his most unseedy decision. 
He hears our screams and cries in his mind one too many times and does us the first solid anybody ever would. He calls the police. And the police come in with child protective services and they swoop us up smelling sour and putrid. And uh, the court documents of that day would read, and I quote, the children lie there in their own filth, screaming and crying not to be neglected, barely clothed, not even a diaper. Lying next to dangerous, sharp drug paraphernalia, metal objects, had they touched, could have killed them. Had they fallen off the bed, they would have cracked their heads open. That's where my life began. Humble beginnings. And me and my brother, we were placed in foster care. A system for all the good it's done in the world has done a world of bad. A system that allows kids to age out to 18 into homelessness onto the streets without a penny in their pockets. A system that allows kids to be abused and neglected by the very foster parents set to protect them. A system for all the good foster parents that are out there still does both of those things today. Jordash and I bounced around from home to home. The idea, my new friends, is that we would be adopted together. Do you think that's what happened? No. Not by a long shot. We both got the same vicious strain of bronchitis in a home filled with neglect, and he died. And people have said to me, quite callously so as an adult, Kevin, why does that matter? You were an infant. How did that affect you? You know, given what you do, and you're educated, you know the first three to nine months of any infant's life are the most crucial for their ability to connect, adapt, attach, and be well in any future. And if the first three to nine months of your life are filled with nothing but consistent trauma, at some point something's got to give and you're going to have a hell of a hard time. A hell of a hard time. When I was bouncing around from home to home without my brother, I developed a severe abandonment issue and detachment disorder from reality at nine months of age. I had a distended belly filled with liquid and a bruise from the top of my sternum to the bottom of my abdomen from being malnourished by mom and dad. We were fed back then what they could steal. Kool-Aid, Coca-Cola, and sour milk was my first nine-month diet. I had no stomach lining. It was nil. I landed, luckily, in a loving and caring home, unlike my poor brother, the home of Deborah and Peter Muller. Peter was in the army. And as they often do, I have to be restationed. And Debbie was a housewife. And they were a transitional home for kids. Many kids in the home at the same time, uh, different ages, boys and girls. Uh, it was maybe six or seven little girls, four or five little boys. Pandemonium, right? And, and me. And one faithful and beautiful and lovely and amazing and gifted day, a woman, a gorgeous woman named Deborah Joan Hines walks in their door. Now, you know my last name. This works out. See that over there? This works out, okay? Spoiler alert, all right? And so... <laughs> Debbie Hines walks in their door, fully expecting to take home a little girl. That was her purpose. She wanted a little girl to be the sister of Elizabeth Catherine, the girl she and Patrick Kevin Hines had already taken in. They wanted to give Elizabeth a sister. I look like a sister to you. <laughs> now, I said this in Australia for the first time, and this little kid, this, this, little, this little guy, right in the, middle, in the middle of the bleachers, leans back, does his gangster lean, and says, Yes, mate. <laughs> so I leaned forward and said, son, you're clearly confused and need glasses, but this is a speech we have to move on. You're not giving it. <laughs> Next. And so we moved on. Uh, <laughs> I lost my place. What was I talking about? <laughs> my, yeah, so Debbie Hines is looking for a little girl, right? But the first thing she sees on the carpeted floor before her, red-headed, wavy-haired, back then, Giovanni in my famous red rubber ducky overalls, which we've all had a pair, we just don't remember, okay? And so she said in her journal of those days, that was the moment she fell in love. And she went back to Patrick Kevin Hines and said, let's take him in, he needs us. He said, let's do it, let's take him in, we should. And they took me in, violently ill for the next 30 days, all day, every day, because of the nil stomach lining. Violently ill, all day, every day. And no doctor back then could tell them what was wrong with their new-to-be son. Every doctor would say, nothing is wrong with this child. Everything is emotional. They were wrong. My gut to brain health was completely out of whack. I was having basically childhood psychosis because of the food I was not being fed. And so I, Pat and Debbie Hines worked tirelessly to get me to a better place. 30 days go by and Debbie Hines is almost fed up. She is ready to give me back to social services, to the foster care system, and ready to give up entirely. She comes to my crib the night before she was to make her decision. And she leans in, and this is all in her journal, and she goes, Gio, you're safe. We're not going anywhere. But if you don't knock this off, we're going to give you back. 
<laughs> and she said it was as if my infant mind had understood her words verbatim because that was the first night we both slept soundly in 30 days. And the next day she came to my crib and I was quiet as a mouse. I was home. Debbie and Pat Hines were my mom and dad. We would adopt two other kids. Elizabeth and myself would be adopted both at four years of age. It would be very tumultuous because back in those days you didn't adopt a kid that wasn't exactly your race. They had a big problem with just me. And then we took in a young boy named Joseph, born addicted to crack cocaine, less than two pounds premature. My brother has had the hardest life of anyone I have ever known, anyone I have ever known living with Asperger's today because of that crack cocaine. And they didn't want us to adopt him. They would not allow us to adopt him. He's black. And they said, no, you can't do this. Matter of fact, social services came to our house to take him from us. We had taken him in. We had nurtured him back to health. We had given him what he needed was a life that was filled with love and unconditional hope and future impossibility. And they came in to take him. My mom was great. She said, um, wait till my husband Patrick gets home. Let's talk a little bit about Debbie and Pat Hines, all right? First of all, Debbie Hines is a consummate optimist, the kind of optimism that is annoying. Mom, it's not that great of a day. <laughs> it's not that great of a day. Stop smiling and calm down. The kind of optimism that when I came home as a grade school kid from all that bullying and hazing, she would say, she would do this, hand to her hip, and she would say, oh, honey, oh, well. And when she does this, it makes sense because she has hair, you know. Oh, honey, oh, well. No, Mom, it's not an oh, well situation. There were banana peels in the garbage can, okay? You know, when, when, when I was a little older playing Little League Baseball, and I, I'd come home defeated because I was the fourth round cleanup hitter. Who played Little League Baseball? Anybody? Anybody? One, maybe eight, ten of you. What do the rest of you do with all of your time? I'm just wondering. And so I played Little League Baseball. I was a fourth round cleanup hitter, which means you're supposed to bring home the grand slam and the win. We lose. Who do they blame? Yeah. Me. I come home crying. Debbie Hines. Oh, honey. K sera, sera, which is a Spanish song. It means what will be, will be. She would sing every lyric to the entire song every time. There was a problem that drove us all bananas, but thank you, Mom, for the optimism it rubbed off. That was Debbie Hines. Now let's talk about Pat Hines, okay? Debbie Hines is the kind of woman who taught me most, life's most valuable lesson. She's taught me to Kevin to never, uh, pardon me, she's taught me to always be kind, compassionate, loving, caring, empathetic, and non-judgmental to every single person I ever come into contact with, no matter their behavior toward me. That's a hard, that's a tall order, right? That's a tall order, but that's what she taught me. It was her most valued life lesson. But my father, Patrick, was a tough SOB. He was a Sunset District Irishman. He was, uh, he was what they call an old San Franciscan. East Coast accent from San Francisco. It made no sense, he and my uncle. It was uh, 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 hilarious at best. And Uncle Kevin and my dad uh, were, were the toughest two men I had ever known. And they were the toughest on me. Uncle Kevin, during my dad's life, was 30 years drunk. Uncle Kevin, who I'm named after, during my life was 30 years sober. He saved my life, but he didn't help my father at all. And my father's mom and dad were just like my biological mom and dad. They had substance use disorder, a different one, primary alcoholism. They died of liver failure, cirrhosis at very young ages, leaving my dad with about $17 in his pocket to make his way in the world, and nothing and no one to help him. My dad would go from the gutter to becoming one of the greatest economists in San Francisco of his time. All he wanted was to grow up, raise a family like he didn't have, and give back. So he and Debbie Hines took in three kids from three separate families into one and made a melting pot of a family, and it was great. We, we didn't care what anybody thought about us. We were beautiful, all right? Irish and German mom and dad, black brother, mixed son and, and a, and a white, white sister. And people were genuinely, totally perplexed and confused. They really were. I mean, women, when women would see me and my mom and my brother and my sister walk together, this is what they would do. Let me be clear, not to offend anyone, white women, this is what they would do. They'd do this. They'd do a semicircle around us like some kind of lion pride. <laughs> they'd lean in like this and they'd do one of these. They'd lean in closer and they'd say, excuse me, miss. And my mom would say, yes. And they would say, how did all of that happen? And that's when my dad, that's when my mom would very aptly and quickly reply, oh, you know, different fathers. <laughs> Which was epic because it was true. It was so damn true. We all had different fathers. They ran right back across the street. We didn't care that some, some restaurants wouldn't allow us to eat at the restaurants at night in California. 
because what we looked like as a family. We got up, went somewhere else, ate something else, because we were happy. We were filled with unconditional love. I thought to myself, growing up as a kid, I thought, how can anything go sideways from here? It's all peaches and cream. We're gonna, everything's going to be great. We're going to have a, a great life. I'm going to grow up. I'm going to get that. I'm going to get into that great school my dad's always talking about. I'm going to get the, uh, the job he's always speaking of, and everything's going to be totally epic. And then it happened on a stage much like this at 17 and a half years of age, right over here. Stage right, my left. My brain broke. I looked out into a crowd of 1,200 people. Not one seat was open, kind of like no seats are open here today. I looked out in this crowd and I believed in a fit of extreme paranoid delusion, the first of my severe symptoms, that disease they would later say I had called bipolar. The very same brain disease both my biological parents had been diagnosed before me when they called it manic depression. I looked out and I thought to myself, every single person in this audience is at any moment going to rush the stage and end my life simultaneously. Let's stop right there. What would you all do if you thought 1,200 people were coming to kill you at once? Cry, run, I heard run. Uh, I, I did cry and I did run. <laughs> that's, that's both, both are applicable. I ran off stage. I ran to the lobby where I was met with by Mr. John Fennell. John Fennell was a character. He was the theater director. He was a failed actor turned high school thespian director. <laughs> but he was the greatest teacher any of us kids would ever have. He taught thousands of kids across the Bay Area. He was an amazing man. He also was very, very flawed. He would be the second person that I grew to love and care for like a second father figure that would die by his hands. We don't have time for that story. John Fennell had a charcoal head of hair because of all the incessant smoking. It was a box haircut from 1987 in the year 1997, but his mustache was from 1962. <laughs> yeah, somehow John made it work. If you did anything other than what John Fennell told you to do on stage, he'd take his left thumb, he'd place it in the right corner pocket of his mouth, he'd pop it out, making it loud, echoing, popping sound throughout the entire theater, and he would say, Heinz, he always called me Heinz, he would say, Heinz, that's the sound of your head coming out of your, anyway, that's not appropriate, <laughs> but, <laughs> but he would say that to me multiple times a day, uh, multiple, because here's the thing, I had blocking lines on stage, your blocking lines on stage, your movement, I would do mine backwards, it drove him bananas, but uh, nonetheless, John Fennell meets me in the lobby. He sits me down in the theater treasurer's chair, which was very fitting because at the time I was the theater treasurer. Yes, me. I ran unopposed and I won because I'm a champion. <laughs> Some of you missed that. Nobody ran against me. Focus. Okay. And so I, I, I'm sitting there and John says to me three sheets to the wind because he would always get drunk before his shows. He could never bear to watch his shows sober. John had substance use disorder. Followed me my whole life. Uh, people around me and, and, and he had primary alcoholism and he, part of why he died would be because of it and, and he looks at me and he goes like this, he goes, Heinz, can you please finish the performance? It's not even intermission yet, what are you doing? And I just babbled incoherent nonsense for the next 10 minutes. I could not make out three words in a row that made sense. John called my mom. And Deborah Joan Hines came to pick me up and I will never forget the look in her eyes as she gazed into mine. Because I could see inside them that she could see within mine the depths of insanity brewing behind them. My mom would call my first psychiatrist. This guy. Dr. J. Kevin Rist. Let's talk about J. Kevin. I have this feeling that my mom only picked J. Kevin because his name and my name are the same. John Kevin. Which is not how you pick a psychiatrist. Come on, that was a damn good one. No? Really? Too soon? We missed that with the floor overheads? His name was Jay Kevin. My name, when you have to explain it, it makes it so much worse. All right. All right. She picked this psychiatrist. She, they said he was one of the best in the field. His secretary, his apprentice, everybody we knew, people we didn't know. He's one of the best in the field. So we went to see him. And Dr. Riss tells me that I have bipolar disorder, type 1 with psychotic features. He puts me on medication. Too much medication for my weight. And uh, it was counteracting itself in my brain. But do you think as a 17-year-old boy, young man, I was adequately following his treatment plan? No. Not by a long shot. I was taking meds one day and not the next, or seven days and not for seven days, or while binge drinking until blackout on the weekends, while on psychotropic meds, which could have ended me, but I wasn't trying to get a buzz or get a high. I was trying to stop the voices I was hearing in my head.
Auditory hallucinations from fourth grade, they had gone away. They were back in full force and they loathed every fiber of my being and all they wanted was my end. And those voices were crushing my soul. Telling me I had to die, telling me I was useless, worthless, and had no value, telling me that I was a burden to everyone in my family, telling me to end my life. From 17 to 19, it was a rocky road, skyrocketing up and crashing down into depression every couple of days. And then my parents got divorced at 18. My mom kicked me out, said, Kick rocks and call your father. I went to go live with my dad. We're fighting every single day, tooth and nail. He's that tough sunset Irishman, and I'm not. It's not going well. And then, at 17, at 19 years of age, on September 24th of the year 2000, my brain tells me I can't take it anymore. My brain says, Kevin, you're done. You have to die. You have no choice. It is inevitable. There are no other options. I said, but I don't want to die. I'm a good person. I don't care. You have to. I would look in the mirror and have a whole conversation with myself as if it was a separate person. Every day. My father was in the very next room and had no idea. On the 25th, I woke up. I grabbed the notebook that was in on my desk. I put it in my note bag. I put that shoulder bag by the door. At 6 in the morning, I went to my father Patrick's room. I startled him awake. Dad wears a CPAP machine. You guys know the CPAP machines? Of course you do. Yeah, he wears that CPAP machine. You're supposed to breathe that thing. You're supposed to keep you from snoring. Not Pat Hines. He does it different. He does it while snoring. It's defective. He doesn't care. And he sounds like this. Like you're a good friend of mine, Circuit of the original 1977, the one that you and the great Darth Vader. <laughs> Snoring, of course. And that's, uh, I start him awake. He looks at me, he says, Kevin, what's wrong? I said, nothing, Dad. I just wanted to tell you that I love you. In my mind, it was for the very last time. He said, well, uh, yeah, Kev, uh, I love you too. But at six in the morning, I don't have to be working until nine, go back to bed. And he fell soundly asleep as quickly as he had awoken. He was good at that. He was like a gift to his. And I walked around to the other side of the bed. I sat on the carpeted floor and I rocked my body back and forth, begging myself to tell the one man who loved me the most in the entire world the truth. But did I? No. no, I buried it and I silenced my pain. Who in this audience, by a bold, true, and honest raise of hands, knows anything at all about silencing their pain? If you all learn nothing else from me today, Nothing else at all. Do me a solid. When you leave those doors and you go about the rest of your natural and beautiful and important and valued lives, never again silence your pain. Your pain is valid. Your pain is worthy of my time and others and your pain matters simply because all of you do. When we silence our pain, when we bury it, it bubbles and festers and grows and it bursts in things like rage, aggression, violence, substance use disorder, suicidal thoughts, ideas, or actions. You deserve this life until your natural end. And suicide can never be the solution to your problem. It is the problem. I didn't know that back then. I wish I knew when I was on that bridge what I know today, that my thoughts do not have to become my actions. Think about that for a minute. My thoughts do not have to become my actions. Say it after me. My thoughts. My thoughts. No, no, no. My th say it after me. And I need to hear all of you. My thoughts, my thoughts. Do, not do not have to become, have to become my, actions. my actions. If all of your thoughts became your actions, how many of you would be in jail for road rage right now? <laughs> oh my God, you're just a bunch of rageful, rageful people. Dear Lord. Danville Area Community College filled with rage. <laughs> if we can recognize, if we can recognize in the face of suicidal crisis that our thoughts don't have to own, rule, or define our next action, we can always remain here. We never have to die by our hands. Trust me from lived experience, I know. I live with regular and chronic thoughts of ending my life, but I'll never die that way. Every time I'm suicidal today, which happens often enough, I will turn to the people in front of me. And I will say four simple but effective words. I need help now. And if I asked you, what would you do? Help 
If I asked you, what would you do? Help. Yes, you would. Yes, you would. Maybe it would take some time, but you would, all right? Here's the deal, all right? We, we, we must ask for help and not be resolved or resigned to thinking that someone else is going to reach in. We have to ask for help when we need it. We have to beg, plead, and ask for help when we need it, especially when suicidal. That suicidal tendency, that ideation, that feeling in your mind, however chronic, however regular, however annoying and overwhelming, does not have to lead to your demise. I have made a decision in my pain, a cognitive decision today. I live with three kinds of chronic pain. The kind from the metal plate that is in my back, and that is the, the only reason I get to stand, walk, and run from what I did that day off that bridge behind me. Ten and a half hour back surgery to replace my shattered vertebrae with titanium. A metal plate and cage and, and cylindrical cage around that, four pins the size of my index finger. The only reason I get to stand today before you. That pain is with me every day, all day long. I'm not complaining, I need no pity. The second pain I have and go through every day is the nerve pain and the skin pain from a skin disease I have that is rare. And it is excruciating. It's intermittent, it comes and it goes. It is with me right at this very moment. It is why my hand is shaking as it is. It hurts like hell. Feeling like knives and needles are coming from my bones through my skin across my entire body. When it first came upon me two and a half years ago, I had a second, secondary burns from the bottom of my feet to the top of my head from, being, from uh, a medical burn, from medications that I had been taking for 20 years to mitigate my mental health, which I had to, which I was glad to because it was helping. I was on the tipping point of what's called Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which I'm sure some of you are very familiar with. And I got very lucky that I didn't become the 1% with that disease. I got what was left behind. And the third kind of pain I deal with is brain pain, which is arguably 300,000 times worse than the other two combined. Pain, my new friends, is inevitable. But suffering is optional. I choose to thrive in spite of my pain. I want you to repeat after me, and I need you to mean it, and I need to hear you. I deserve, I deserve this life, this life until, my natural end. until my natural end. I am a gift, I am a gift to, everyone to everyone who looks at me. Looks at me. I, am I am supposed, supposed to, be here. to be here. And damn it, and damn it. come on, and damn it, I am, I am gorgeous. gorgeous. Well, thank you. <laughs> you see, my friends, we can let our pain defeat us, or we can let it build us brick by brick from the ground up. I choose the latter. I went to that bridge at 19. I believed I had to die, and yes, I jumped off. At the millisecond that my hands left that rail, it was an instantaneous regret for my actions and the 100% recognition that I just made the greatest mistake of my life, and it was too late. 99% of those who've attempted off the Golden Gate Bridge never, ever get to tell their stories. 99% of them are gone. Well over 3,000 people, if you have the accurate count. The greatest space for suicide in the world, no matter who tells you otherwise. I fell 220 feet, 25 stories, at 75 miles an hour in four seconds, and these were the thoughts in my mind as I fell. What have I just done? I don't want to die. God, please save me. And then I hit the water. Hitting that water from that height at that speed was like hitting a solid brick wall. I missed that day severing my spinal cord by two millimeters. Millimeters. I went down 70 feet beneath the water surface and I opened my eyes. I'm alive and I'm drowning and I didn't want to drown. And that was my first thought. I don't want to drown. Why'd you jump into a giant body of water, you idiot? Come on, that was a good one. <laughs> if I said it, it's okay. Come on, it's my story. Good Lord. And I swam 70 feet to the surface in one breath, praying the entire time that I would live. 70 feet without the use of my legs. Thinking to myself, I'm not going to make it. I got closer and closer to the lit circle of water above me. I thought, I'm having, I'm convulsing, I, I'm running out of air. This is my end and I don't want to die. No one's going to know that I don't want to die. I broke the surface. I bobbed up and down in the water and I prayed, God, please save me. I don't want to die. I made a mistake on repeat and I believe he heard me. In that water, as I bobbed up and down, swallowed salt water, spit some out. I just kept praying. 
A woman driving by in a red car saw me go over that rail at the moment in which I did, and she called her friend on her car phone. You heard me, car phone, year 2000. Called her friend in the United States Coast Guard. The only reason the Coast Guard got to my position in the water before I would set the hypothermia and drown within three minute window was because that woman making that phone call. In that water as I flailed to stay afloat, something began to circle beneath me. Something very large and very slimy and very, very alive. And I remember thinking to myself, you've got to be kidding me. I didn't die jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge and a shark is going to eat me. No, no. And I punched this thing with my bad arm and it won't go away. It won't stop circling, circling faster and faster. I'm waiting it to bite off an arm or a leg or an ear like Tyson. Whatever, you know. <laughs> What, was that too soon? Was that too soon? Is that too soon? Come on. Come on. He's a personal friend. It's okay. All right. And so, come on. And so it's not biting anything. It's just circling beneath me, bumping me up. No longer am I wading in the water. I'm lying atop it, being kept buoyant by this creature, this mammal, thinking to myself, this is one hell of a nice shark. <laughs> and so I did what any of you would do in this situation. What any of us would do. I named him Herbert. <laughs> It was either that or Mortimer. I mean, it, was, it had to be an old-timey name, you know? Herbert the life-saving, whatever the hell he was. A year later, I would find out what he was. I would find out a year later that on a television program on ABC News with John Quinones, you know, the guy does the show, what would you do? On the show, I said to John Quinones, I, said, I thought there was a shark beneath me in the water. People wrote into the show from all over the world. One man's letter stuck out above all the rest. His name was Morgan McWard. He was from Las Vegas, Nevada. He was on the bridge that day with his mom. He said, Kevin, by the way, just as a sidebar, ABC sent me a manila envelope filled with paper emails. Does that make any sense? Just send me the emails. What are you doing? It's year 2000. What are they thinking? And, and uh, I get this letter from Morgan McWard, and it says, Kevin, I'm so very glad you're alive. I was standing less than two feet away from you when you jumped. Until this day, no one would tell me whether you lived or died. It's haunted me until right now. By the way, Kevin, there was no shark, like you mentioned on the show, but there absolutely was a sea lion. And the people above looking down believed it to be keeping your body afloat until the Coast Guard boat arrived behind you. Now you call that what you want. That's my miracle, and I believe. Now, in that, thank you, and in that water, in that water, the Coast Guard boat arrived. The creature took off. They pulled me onto a flatboard. They stuck me into a, a brace. They put a neck brace around my neck, strapped me in from head to toe, and they started asking questions. Kid, do you know what you just did? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they said, why? I had no answer. I said, I don't know. I thought I had to die today. One guy leans in. He puts his hand on my forehead and says, kids, you're a miracle. The senior officer leans in and says, son, do you understand how many people we pull out of these waters that are already gone? I said, no, sir, and I don't want to know. He said, I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> he said, young man, this unit alone has pulled 57 dead bodies out of these waters and one live one. They call that perspective, don't they? Yeah. Coast Guard got me to the hospital. At the hospital, the surgeon, oh, the surgeon. One of the foremost surgeons on the West Coast was leaving for the day out of the emergency ward when I was coming in. He opted to do me a solid and stay. He and his team went in. I've got a 23 staple scar across my left side that no amount of Mederma is going to make go away. So that's a medical cream for women who have who get pregnant. <laughs> I'm just saying. It's for stretch marks and scars. I'm just saying. And so, 23 stable scar across my left side for my surgery, for that metal cage and wiring and, 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 and plating. And I remember vividly when they pulled out the first staple. Good Lord, it hurts so bad. I said, Stop that. I said, Stop. G give me the staple remover thingy. They said, That's not what it's called. I said, Give me the thingy. I took it and they let me pop out 2, 3, 4, 6, 12, all the way to 23. I needed to do it. I needed to feel it with my bare hands, in my arm, go through my shoulders, into my skin, so I would know what never to ever, ever, ever do again, no matter the pain I was in. On that day, in a moment's notice, 
after that surgery, I did have one recognition of my true value, of my value. Yes, I would get suicidal over and over and over and over and over again, but I always go back to logic, not the rapper itself, logic. <laughs> I would go back to logic. That when I would have paranoid delusions that told me that people were coming to kill me, I would say, Kevin, how many times have they? The answer would be zero. So they're not going to. Kevin, uh, your mom and dad, uh, they hate you. You, you. They think you're a burden. Is that true? No. They never have. They even told me to, their face, to my face, that's not accurate. Or Kevin, uh, your wife is going to leave you because you have a brain disease. Has it happened yet? No. Not going to happen. I would always go back to logic. I would be determined to recognize my own actual truth. Instead of lying to myself or letting the suicidal ideations run my soul, which is what they would do in the past. So yes, I went to that bridge. Yes, I, I jumped off. Yes, people talk about it. But the greatest part of my story is not about that bridge. It's about how I live, find, and stay in recovery one day at a time, every day today. And I want to share that with you. I'm here to not give you a bunch of rhetoric. I'm not here to give you a bunch of rhetoric and leave you with nothing. Besides this idiot to the left, my wife thought that was a good idea. He's just staring at me. It's really creepy. <laughs> could, we, could we... I'm like in the palm of my hand. It's creepy as hell. Margaret, her name's Margaret. I've got to talk to her about this. All right, so can we, can we turn the lights down? I want to share with you guys what's actually important, my resources that can help you today. Can we turn, there we go. All right. All right, so do me a favor. Those of you who don't like writing things down, take out your mobile devices and record this. You're not going to miss it because you could actually use this to help someone save a life. So please, take out your, your phones or, or your mobile devices or your Androids that take longer, whatever. Just take out your things. Just, uh, <laughs> Oh, yeah, buddy. <laughs> All right. I'm kidding. You're wonderful androids. All right, here we go. All right. If you are in this room and you are in crisis right now or you know someone who may be, you can text CNQR to 741741, the crisis text line. That stands for courage to talk about your mental health. Normalize the conversation. Ask the question, are you suicidal and do you have, have you made a plan to take your life? It does not put the thought in someone's mind statistically. It gives them permission to talk about their pain. R is for recovery, living proof. To 741741. You can call. The, Na the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255, plus one for military veterans and servicemen and women and individuals. You also know that that might change to 988, which is a three-digit number very soon due to our government's issues with fielding the calls. We need to have it a shorter call time. When you go over here to the resources, and you go resources, www.kevinhinesstory.com slash resources, or even just as it is, um, there are three resources for you right now that are free, downloadable, and are, are changing people's lives. There is what is called the Art of Wellness, which is trainable by you to staff, peers, or other people. Um, uh, it's trainable by clinicians. The Art of Wellness, my 10-step guide to the art of better mental health. It is a, a great guide that is helping people all over the world as far as Peru, Africa, Japan, and China, and America. It is something that when people follow it from six to nine months in, in, at a time, they're seeing a significant improvement in their brain health. That is yours. It's free. People hawk this stuff for a lot of money. I give it away. Uh, our foundation tries to do that often, as often as we can. The second resource on that guide channel is... Um, a parents, teachers, and clinicians guide to teen suicide. If you have a teenager that you are worried about, that guide is very, very good. It is one of the most heavily downloaded in the field. It is written by my wife uh, and uh, some of the greatest suicidologists in the field. Uh, our, our hashtag and motto, if you want to share this, is be here tomorrow and we use Hope Nation. But if you go up here, uh, I want you to join the team at youtube.com slash Kevin Hines. There are 400 videos, all brain, mind, behavior, health, help, in entertaining, engaging, and, 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 and energizing ways. We're using the power of media. Media is the fastest way to reach any human being right now. Video media. It's the fastest way to reach any human being right now. The problem is, we can turn the lights back on. Uh, the problem is there's way too much negative media out there for us to consume. Way too much. All this stuff is designed scientifically to help people in pain stay and fight the pain and be, be here tomorrow and every day after that. From the bottom of my heart, yet, ladies and gentlemen, yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. That is why we call it the present. Thank you for listening. I appreciate you to my core. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Now, really quick, uh, just given, given the work you guys do, I want to ask you a question. On the, uh, you can go to that YouTube channel, go to comment section. If, if you don't get any questions answered today, and you have questions about mental health and, and personal perspective or lived expertise or lived experience, ask them there. We have, a, we have a session or a series called Ask Kev, where we have a clinician's perspective from our clinical director at the Kevin and Margaret Hines Foundation and myself. We answer all your questions, any questions you might have if you join the team and you ask a question that is reputable and about mental health. We will answer it in a timely manner and get it out to the channel for you. Thank you, guys. Okay, just real quickly before you guys uh, head out, we want to thank Kevin and his crew for coming. Um, thank all of you for attending as well. Don't forget to do your surveys. Um, and also, just so everyone knows, here at DAC, if you are going through something, we do have crisis counseling available in the advising and counseling office. We can also refer you to services in the community, so please come and see us if you need us. Um, and again, we did want to give a special shout out to Ashton, um, OSF, and the Mental Health Board for really helping and, and getting this together today. Thank you again. Thank you.